Engorgio. Ugh. No, 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 we don't want that. That's hideous. Uh, Reducto. Okay, uh, let's try Vantage. Engorgio. That's better. What do you think? So guys, welcome back to RBR and to the SUV with the soul of a sports car. It's the new sports SUV DBX by Aston Martin and it really is crunch time. The new car is being built in a whole new plant in St. Athens in Wales. It is the final bit of work from former CEO Andy Palmer in his second generation plan. And it comes in as AMG legend Tobias Moores takes the helm of the company. In today's review, I'll have two different DBXs in case you're getting confused why the spec keeps changing. But don't worry, there's not one YouTuber edition in sight. So now let's explore together Aston's first ever SUV, the DBX. So guys, car industry fact, SUVs make lots of money. They make money in the right countries, they make money with the biggest and the most important demographics. So for a car company that's looking to expand its customer reach and its cash reserves, making an SUV is pretty much the way to go these days. But because of the popularity of SUVs, this side of the market, even in the premium SUV side, is hugely contested. There are some serious vehicles here. And the DBX starts at 158,000 pounds. On a configurator, you will very quickly get to 170 and 180. And that price range puts it dead in the sights of Lamborghini's super SUV, Urus, and stuff like the Bentayga. But then the Urus has 650 brake horsepower, a zero to 60 very close to three seconds versus this, with 540 odd and a 0 to 60 of 4.3. Heck, a fully specced RSQ8 Vorsprung will cost you only 126K and it'll still give you 600 brake horsepower and a 0 to 60 of three something. So how are Aston gonna have this DBX really stand apart like its brothers, the DB11 and Vantage seem to do so easily, especially in a fiercely competitive market like the premium SUVs? So Aston's first shot at it was the extremely strange DBX concept. I'm not sure what they were smoking when they came up with it. Thankfully, they got rid of that entire idea and instead decided to settle on something that is a lot more traditional in shape and something that a supercar owner can viably use day to day as you're going to school, going to groceries, going to Ikea type car. Now, the fact that this car has its infotainment and electronics, engine, gearbox, maybe even part of the suspension, given by Mercedes and AMG and adapted by Aston. And the fact that a lot of the mules actually had a load of E63 cladding all around them. A lot of people rightfully thought maybe this is all based on a Mercedes SUV, including the platform. Luckily, that is absolutely not the case. This is a completely from scratch, unique platform by Aston Martin for their SUV. It's clean sheet design is a bonded aluminum platform, just like in DB11 and Vantage, and it's made specifically for DBX. And what that's given Aston is complete freedom in terms of technologies and design and everything about the car to make it exactly the way they wanted it to be. So the first thing that you notice in the design is that the car actually looks really, really quite small. Certainly it looks a lot smaller than some of the rivals, and it really looks like it's in almost the class below, kind of a Stelvio or a GLC size car. And that is because they had the ability to make a completely new platform that suited what they thought a sports SUV should be like, which is something that is significantly shorter in height, though it has the same width because it should have the presence of a sports car. It's got extremely smooth edges and very short overhangs, I think helps this whole size perception. Of course, the likening to the Vantage helps as well. It's got a flat floor, which means there's no sill to climb over when getting in and out, which makes it the easiest to get in and out of. Yet despite all of this, despite the size of it, it actually has class leading interior space according to Aston. And all of this, again, it stems from having a unique platform rather than the VW cars, which all have to share the same thing. In terms of the internals, we've got a fully adaptive air suspension, which links to a 48 volt system with anti-roll stabilization with up to 1400 Newton meters of torque of anti-roll stabilization per axle. And all of that links toward 
a completely variable four-wheel drive system that can send up to 100% power to the rear wheels in an e-diff. Now, all of this is pretty standard among the performance SUV crowd these days, so we have to see whether the actual chassis itself can differentiate itself on the road when we go on the drive later. Now, in terms of the design, there's a lot of modern and classic Aston Martin within it. Of course, you've got the typical Aston Martin grille, as you'd find in DB11 and across history with DB9, etc. But what's nice is the bonnet. It's an extremely low bonnet. Look how low that is versus the typical SUVs that we have reviewed on the channel. And you've got those slats within the bonnet, like you would find, say, on the V8 DB11 as well. Very similar looking. Speaking of which, lights, again, remind me pretty much, I think, of DBS. Very similar. Your daytime running lights, though, are these ones here. I think they're a little bit poxy. I like the fact that air can flow through them and they're an actual aerodynamic feature, but on the road, when the car is following you, these don't give it any presence because these are the proper Aston lights. That being said, this is the first version of the DBX. There'll probably be more powerful ones, and I'd like to see something different there because that, to me, is a little bit boring. But generally, the sculpture on the front, and again, I love how low it is. This is what really sets apart this car in person versus all the others, is the fact that it looks a lot more sports car-like than any other SUV would dare to. The side is interesting, though I do take people's point on how it reminds you of like the Jaguar F-Pace, I-Pace, etc. I can see that, but this is a lovely, lovely feature in the wing that flows then through into the side. You can hardly see it in the black, I think, the previous spec that we first reviewed was a lot better in that regard because you could really appreciate the cuts of the car, which then of course lead into the rear end. And you can see a very unique roof line actually that ends quite soon. And then the SUV continues on a bit more like say a DB11 would. But then I'm conflicted on the rear as well. I like the Vantage light, but then there's this big patch here of just pure metal work that's got nothing on it. The lower diffuser is nice, you've got some big exhausts, you've got a very big diffuser, which is again, very, very DBS, DB11-like. Another cool thing is we've got frameless doors, as you can see, glass B-pillar. DBX also has the slightly curved upward, I believe it's called Swan doors, as you'd find in DB11 and Vantage, which is really nice that they brought it into the SUV as well. And the majority of the car really sits on the rear wheels, which is quite similar to a sports car. What I am a big fan of of the rear has to be the spoiler on top and the shape that it gives the overall side profile of the rear. I'm not a big fan of these ribbon style antler wheels. I prefer the sport ones. When you put those on this spec car, suddenly it looks like something James Bond would actually want to drive. What I do find amazing though at this price point is you don't get carbon ceramic brakes. What is that all about? In terms of power, we've got 542 brake horsepower, 700 Newton meters, zero to 60 of 4.3. The engine itself, yes, from AMG, but it's been tuned specifically by Aston for their own application, though it's similar in its structure to what you'll find in, say, an E63. Of course, the Aston application is different. It actually has a different firing order and software, so it should sound different as well. The nine speed is apparently also sourced from Mercedes, but all the driving modes and all the electronic application within that is Aston Martin's own. So we'll see what those driving modes are like when we go out in a minute. In terms of the future, I'd like to see like another level higher in terms of performance, because you've got enough space to add horsepower. I mean, the Mercedes application of this engine can easily produce 620, 630 brake horsepower. And the design of the DBX really lends itself to something that could be a lot more aggressive particularly on the lower half and on the lower rear as well. So I'm excited to see what Aston do after this initial car. Now, let's have a look inside because it's a really, really nicely trimmed interior. So guys, inside DBX, the first thing that most people will talk about is the infotainment system being shared with Mercedes. But I'm gonna do the exact same thing because it is something that you interact with a lot. But before I go into that, I also want to point out that the main competitors to this car, namely Urus, which uses an Audi system along with Audi sounds, and the Bentley Bentayga, which uses the Porsche system with Porsche sounds, etc. So pretty much an even playing field as far as sharing infotainment technologies go. The good thing about the Aston one is it is actually heavily, heavily reskinned. They put their own Aston Martin sounds in, for example, this one rather than using the Mercedes ones, which is good. Same with the indicators. 
it is last generation Mercedes rather than being current generation Audi or Porsche as far as the rival goes. So it's the exact same system as you would find in say E63 of the previous generation. That's not to say it's bad. The great thing about it is unlike the others which rely on touch, you can use the traditional round module here. And as I always say, I don't like touch screens in cars. I prefer having buttons and things where I can hear that and know how much I've clicked and where I'm clicking. So I find this a lot safer. You do get CarPlay, which is the main thing I would use in a car these days anyway. And it's nice that you have actual buttons here. I mean, I love this like Vantage inspired center console. I like the gap at the bottom here as well. This is very cool. You can kind of feel like you can put your phone there. You've got your boot opening switch down the bottom. But yeah, this is all very Aston Martin. It's very Aston sports car. I love the fact that they retained the buttons for starting the car and the gears, etc., all up here. Again, very, very Aston Martin. And another great thing about the system is when you shift through the different modes here, you then get different designs here for those modes going from terrain to GT mode to sport to sport plus. Each one has its own flavor, which is lovely because again, not enough of the manufacturers really do that. Steering wheel is exactly the same as you'd find in DB11 and Vantage. You got lovely, nice big paddle shifters here as well. And the good thing is, it's an Aston steering wheel, unlike say the Urus, which is using an Audi one. So this is pure Aston Martin. Apart from that, it really does look like a Vantage or a DB11 interior. It's nice that I'm sitting really quite low versus other SUVs as well. All the stitching, yes, some of it, it does look a little bit like a baseball or quite rough, but I think it's got character to do it. It's quite kind of hand stitched and it gives you that feeling of something that's been lovingly curated by hand rather than by machine, which I appreciate. And plus you'll see the types of leather and patterns and brogue stitching, etc., that you would never find on another car. I like the premium look of the vents. The back is stitched in a similar way. Your seats are lovely with the stitching. You've got Aston Martin on the headrest as well. It looks like a DB11. And that's, I think, what you really want coming into this car. But it improves upon the DB11 with a much better infotainment system, a full digital screen, and of course, practicality with three proper seats in the rear, loads and loads of boot space. So the first true five-seater Aston Martin. How does it sound like? I'll show you now. It's got a menacing growl to it. Now I've had a lot of AMG V8, specifically this four litre in this driveway. This car does not sound like any of them. So very different exhaust system, very different sound coming out of it as well. What I really wanna see though is what does it sound like on the road and how is this car gonna differentiate itself from the plethora of rivals that it has to face? So guys, listen to that. <laughs> I was not expecting brutal noises coming out of this in a post OPF car. Pops and bangs and growling and anger. This is an exciting SUV. And you'll forgive me, I was as honest as possible in my walk around as to where I think this car sits, the problems I think it's gonna have, how similar it sounds on paper to the others, but immediately, I mean, just to fill you in, I am in sport mode. There's a Sport Plus, which is a stage higher, but sport is more than enough for these type of country lanes. And it really does have a completely different driving appeal to its competitors. I mean, first of all, steering is a lot better than the Urus, like it's on another level. And for me, that's always the first thing. It really annoys me when you have a very powerful, otherwise pretty dynamic car able to handle its weight and the steering is poo. That is simply not the case with DBX. It's got some nice feedback on the steering wheel. Not quite as much as say on a Porsche Cayenne, which I feel you get a lot more feedback in, but a lot better than this car's direct rivals, which are the Urus and the Bentaygas of the world. You can really feel how much that active anti-roll stabilization is doing work as well, because you don't get that much body roll at all in this car. Very, very good at controlling the weight. You don't feel any roly-poliness that you would normally feel in an SUV. And I think the shorter height 
of this car really helps in that regard as well. If anything, because of that, I've got that much more confidence going in and out of a corner, despite the fact that this hasn't got rear wheel steering like something like the Urus would have. Instead, I don't know, the chassis just feels that much more sportive. It really does remind me of DB11 in a lot of ways. I won't like it to Vantage because I really love the sporting character of that car. And no matter how good an SUV is, it's not going to match that. But the fact that it's so similar to their sports GT. And in fact, you know what? In a lot of ways, it actually feels a little bit more engaging. And what I mean by that is it kind of feels like a big performance hatchback. Knock it down into GT mode for a minute and then everything calms down. It suddenly becomes a lot more compliant. You've got those big 22 inch wheels, which then seem to handle the terrain a lot better. So it's great that we've got that adaptive suspension set up you do see a very big difference going from comfort sport to sport plus because the steering is good in this car equally in comfort you don't have that many inputs that you need to make you can drive it in a very relaxed manner and for me that's a big litmus test on the comfort of a performance car that the steering has to be good enough to be used daily without being hindersome now one thing that i think is a bit sluggish this nine speed there's like a half a second delay between upshifting and I think that's just too slow when you've got a car that otherwise handles so much better than the competition. I'm sure this could be fixed with a software update because the Mercedes application doesn't seem to lag as much as this. Yes it is a bit laggy the 9 speed Mercedes one but here you'll see it's just not quite as snappy as what you'd find in a Vantage or a DB11. One big plus point of this car has to be the engine. What's nice about it, obviously it makes lovely sound, but it's quite unique to the Aston as we found standing still as well. The revs are very, very different to the AMG application, but it maintains the best bits, which is that naturally aspirated engine feel, the torque curve, the immediate response you get to throttle inputs, regardless of what mode you're in. And of course, the oral character cannot be dismissed. It makes it so much more exciting than the rivals. And I suspect even the AMG application of this engine in say the GLE 63S just isn't gonna sound as good as this DBX. In terms of speed, it doesn't feel lacking. And I think the exhaust note that you have behind it really makes up for a lot of that. But then it's, it's not got that rapid shoot yourself into the distance speed. That's something like the Eurus does. Does that count against the car? Not in my opinion, because you guys know I'm of the opinion that modern cars have too much horsepower anyway, but I would still never say no to a little bit more poke. So guys, I stand quite surprised here with a car on paper that I didn't think I would be super excited about. And it's turned out to be actually pretty much one of the most dynamic SUVs that I've driven in recent times. Fun, I think, is the word that comes to mind with this car. And fun is really what a sports SUV has got to be all about. So where I'm not convinced on, say, the look of the car, maybe the infotainment system, what I'm definitely convinced about is what a good basis this is to make a sports SUV. So what titillates me is this is the first DBX. You can have more powerful, more dynamic ones, more crazy looking ones, and it's such an awesome basis to do all of those things. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this first drive of the new DBX. It's really surprised me in a lot of ways. I've really enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this episode, please do like, subscribe, hit that bell icon, and I'll see you again next time. I'm going to enjoy this thunderous V8.